black people. Despite the violence and intimidation, the black colleges survived. Black people were in charge. If you come here, you will find something you won't find any place else. Tell them we are rising. Nelson's film touches a number of HBCUs in telling this compelling story and leaves off with a question about the future of these schools. We're here to fill a few gaps and springboard from a different perspective. I'm gathered at a table of prestigious university and college leaders and a room of alumni, students, and others to examine the value of these schools as economic and social change agents for our communities. If you'd like to engage with us during this conversation, please join us on Twitter and use the hashtag NCBlackIssues. Right now, I want to welcome our distinguished roundtable of HBCU leaders. Dr. Paulette Dillard, Interim President of Shaw University. Dr. Everett B. Ward, President of St. Augustine's University. Dr. James A. Anderson, Chancellor of Fayetteville State University. Dr. Dorothy Brown, Provost of Bennett College. Dr. Jemmy R. Jenkins, Sr., President of Livingstone College. Dr. Elwood L. Robinson, Chancellor of Winston-Salem State University, and Dr. Johnson O. Akinleyi, Chancellor of the youngest HBCU in the cohort, North Carolina Central University. We are going to get to our conversation in just a moment, but first we bring you an exclusive preview of a film in the works about the oldest HBCU in the Southeast by filmmaker Hal Goodtree. We purchased the Behringer Estate, which for the beauty of its grounds had been the pride of the people of the city. This purchase also stirred up no little opposition among the white people. And thus, while we succeeded at last in obtaining a valuable property, we had at the same time excited great indignation against us. Henry Martin Tupper. You can't have racism if you don't have power. Henry Martin Tupper has robbed me of the ability to have bias against white people. He was a white man who was a union chaplain who at the end of the war decided to stay and to teach newly freed slaves how to read and how to write. There's a saying that without knowledge, the people perish. As the oldest HBCU in the South, Shaw has led the way. These were not only academic institutions, they were freedom schools. Plessy versus Ferguson institutionalizes, separate but equal. Shaw University, like many institutions that had seen golden years of establishing opportunities for free blacks, began to struggle with its identity and it began to struggle with its very existence. With the coming of student activists, you see that there is a very consistent and persistent effort to dismantle segregation through direct action, nonviolent protests. The sit-ins were directed at variety stores that would allow us to shop, but we could not sit down at the lunch counters. I was the first to be arrested. Those young men and women who came to create the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee fanned out throughout the South, put their lives on the line to tear down the walls of segregation. No SNCC, no Civil Rights Act, no Voting Rights Act, no Obama. Change has come to America. It's just as clear as anything. If there is an antidote to racism in this nation, it is education. We need more soldiers of truth who are willing to step forward and follow that inner voice that lets you know what's right and what's wrong. Once Mr. Berenger found out that his property had been sold to a northerner for the purpose of educating the freed slaves, his comment at the time was, if I had known that my property was going to be sold to those niggers, I would not have sold it. And that was a clip 
from a new film in production by filmmaker Hal Goodtree. It's a great way to start, I think, this conversation with Shaw University, Dr. Dillard. And I want to put a question out there on the table and get your reflections on it. When you hear the relevance of HBCU's question today, how do you respond? I respond with, you know, almost, um, you know, a, a question of why is there a question? <laughs> the fact that we have prominent um, citizens who all came out of HBCUs that would not have been able to go to other institutions, then, you know, I question why there is a question. We continue to provide meaningful citizens in every walk of life. Um, the ability to change communities, you know, to change a nation, you know, is all represented by, you know, um, products of HBCUs. I'm a product of HBCUs. And many of those that are sitting around this room are products of HBCUs. And they have made incredible contributions to the nation and to the world. And that contribution is still as relevant today as it was in 1865 when Henry Martin Tupper came to Raleigh, you know, to educate freed slaves. And I'd like to hear um, your, your response on that, Dr. Robinson, as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think today they're more relevant than ever before. Uh, in one of the clips that we just saw, they talked about being freedom schools. And one of my mentors told me once that education is an engine of opportunity. And so when you think about how these schools were formed for recently emancipated slaves, most of them, my institution started in 1892 by Simon Green Atkins. And what he said is something that drives me every day, every day that I wake up. When he started, when he wanted to start the institution, he went around to the powers that be. And he said, I wanna create a school for recently emancipated slaves and then someone asked them, say, what will you teach at that school for individuals that ultimately will just work with their hands? And so he asked the question that drives me. He said, what do they teach at Harvard? And what do they teach at the world's great institutions? That's what I will teach at my university. That's the platform that I operate on every day. I think for, for us at uh, NCCU, the question isn't simply, are we relevant? And as you've heard, uh, I think for 170 years plus, we've demonstrated our relevance. I mean, you look around you, we've been producing leaders, um, social workers, uh, lawyers and judges and legislators and around the state and around the country. The question for us is, what do we need to do to continue to be relevant, especially today? Uh, there has been a lot of challenges for us. When I look at, I've seen this, this, this movie here, I mean, this documentary here. What I took away from it is the idea that our students at HBCUs have been at the forefront of fighting for equal education, the opportunity for access in all of our HBCUs. And we're still doing that today. And it's very important for us, for our students who are in our institution today, to understand that the students like them who stood up so that they can have the opportunity that they have now. So the question is, how do we continue to do that in order for us to be relevant? And what do we need to do to sustain our relevance? And as we think about that relevance, I think about the, the economic impact. A lot of times it comes down to the dollars and cents. There's a recent UNCF study that has shown a $1.7 billion economic impact of North Carolina's collective HBCUs on the larger economy. And, and Dr. Brown, I wanted to ask you to sh kind of weigh in on behalf of Bennett and share how you all are impacting uh, the triad. I think we're impacting the triad in many ways in terms of our students and the jobs that they secure, but, but, but also in terms of student, uh, uh, community engagement. 
you know, our students are involved in a variety of uh, jobs, uh, uh, volunteer projects, in which they don't get paid for, but they give back to the community. And that's very much a part of what Bennett is about. And I believe I support you in terms of thinking about where do we go, where do we go now? Because we know that we're, I don't want to say we're in jeopardy, but people are questioning our, our viability. And I think we are very viable. But I think as you look at some of the new approaches and the new things that we're doing, we're going to have a greater impact, you know, in terms of looking at the workforce. What, what do we need for the workforce? You know, how should we be training our students? So I think we're making um, a tremendous economic impact in terms of just our students being out there and giving back to the community. And historically, black colleges have that legacy. I mean, we have always been involved in the community. I mean, I think other groups are trying to pick up on that. And so I, I, I think we continue to make that um, contribution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jenkins, how, are, how, are, how is Livingstone re positioning itself and um, adhering to a mission to uh, be relevant and meet the needs of today's um, students? Well, first of all, in Rowan County, we are a corporation in essence that is probably one of the largest corporations generating revenues for the for that county. We have an impact of over fifty seven million dollars annually in that in that area. That's not really the 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 purpose, but the idea is that we have an economic impact in the area. Now, secondly. We remind ourselves that education is the surest vehicle for upward mobility in the world. And so we want to make it clear that where we are trying to go is to educate all of our students. Our motto is we take our students where they are. We take them where they need to be so that they can command their rightful place in the global society. And so that's our challenge. And that's what we continue to do. And we are relevant today as, as we were when we first got started, and we are 138 years old. 138 years <clears throat> strong, and when so, I think about the when I think about not only the impact, uh, the economic impact, we think about jobs, but there are th these schools are employers as yeah. well, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ward. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. St. Augustine's <laughs> is very fortunate. Uh, we produce $72 million to the economy mm -hmm. of Wake County and the state of North Carolina, and we are taxpayers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that people often mm -hmm. overlook. We are an economic engine. But beyond that, we are servant leaders in our mm -hmm. communities as well. Uh, our students contribute greatly. But if you think about education as, as upward mobility, as Dr. Jenkins said, there is clear documentation that a student with a college degree in his lifetime or her lifetime will make substantially more than an individual with that does not have a college degree. And I think it's very important for us to understand the relevancy of historical black colleges continues, but we also need to remove the myth that historically black colleges are less prepared academically than any other institutions. If you look at our existence, St. Augustine's in 1867, four million newly freed slaves in the South. We bought a hospital out of St. Augustine <laughs> University, St. Agnes Hospital, mm -hmm. when healthcare was not provided to people of color. Mm -hmm. We built that hospital, students built that hospital, and it served from 1897 until 1960. And too frequently we forget the history of America. It was not but yesterday that we could not attend the other institution. So when we talk about the relevancy, I think we have to put it in its proper context historically that the other institutions were not available to us as a people. And we founded these mm -hmm. schools and produced the best and the brightest mm -hmm. people. And our institutions and our students have made America realize the true mm -hmm. promise of democracy. And Deborah, I think that's very important because my colleagues, you know, my my colleagues at PWIs, predominantly white institutions, I always say to them, we're 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 not deficient, we're different. And by that I mean, you know, we take a lot of students who would not be in college. We take a number of first generation students and we mold them 
and we help them to develop. And I think all of us can cite examples of students who would not be where they are today if it were, if it were not for being at these institutions. So we're different, not deficient. And I think that that really speaks to the transformative power of HBCUs. When you are able to shepherd um, a strong student through, then then you're you've been you've done a good job. Yes. But when you're able to take uh, someone who's whose path was was headed a different direction and actually turn that around. That's transformative, that's, right. that's creative, and that's extremely powerful. Uh, Dr. Anderson, I wanted to, to bring you in on the conversation because we're talking about relevancy. And a lot of people will look at an HBCU and say, well, absolutely, let's take a look at the history, how important that was, and the fact that it was, uh, these institutions were established during segregation, but there's no more segregation and there are strong students out there who continue to choose to attend HBCUs. Uh, Jim Crow is gone. And so why are these institutions remaining predominantly African-American? Um, yes, some are and some aren't. I mean, the demographics of Fayetteville and Cumberland County uh, speak to the fact that we're the most diverse institution in the UNC system now. 44% of our students are military. Our average age is 25 instead of 18 or 19. We don't focus as much on first time freshmen. We focus on commuters and returning adults, et cetera. So that dictates, you know, students vote with their feet mm -hmm. and they'll come to you or they'll leave you based on what you can provide for them. And that's a reality. Okay. One of the, I want to take a little different slant on this economic impact that you're talking about, because we all have evidence that we're having an economic impact, but let's say a good swath of our students end up going into a hospitality field where your options are gonna be limited as you climb the employment ladder. That is not what I want to do at Fayetteville State. And that's not what anyone at this table wants to do, okay? We have an economic impact, but in Fayetteville, black people are not significant players in the economy of Fayetteville or Raleigh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference mm -hmm. between having a $365 million impact, that's the earning power our students have, but yet I look at Fayetteville and we're not in the top tiers. Okay. And why of is being that? Powerful, okay? what, what, how well, does that impact, how does that, that connection? Well, one of the things that means is when major decisions happen in the city about the future of that city, which is gonna include our future, we're not there, we're not at the table. Now, fortunately, we just uh, have a newly minted black mayor uh, who's gonna be very serious in terms of that. But we have a lot of powerful older white families that control what goes on in the city or in the case of the research triangle mm -hmm. what controls what goes on in the raleigh area etc and we need to make sure that we're preparing our students with the right disciplines to be competitive in the 21st century the other part of that is education itself we this is called fair representation in this country we fought a war called the the Revolutionary War, but it should be called the War for Fair Representation because it started as taxation without fair representation. Education provides our young people the opportunity to be able to become fairly represented in our communities. And so that's what this is all about. Education is our civil rights struggle of today. And we need to make sure that as we educate more of our people, they can move into those tables and places around the city and otherwise and represent us where decisions are being made. That's really what it's all about. Well, what I'd like to add, though, uh, Dr. Anderson, is that these, these schools are preparing uh, students very well in many cases to go out there, but your point is well taken. Where are the opportunities and where are the people around the table to kind of pr provide those networks and and usher in these prepared students. If we're gonna prepare students to really have that impact we're talking about, then we have to prepare entrepreneurs. We, we can let students major in finance or we can make them top-notch financial managers, okay? So we have to think of the ways that we expand what have been our historical majors and disciplines to those that really make this kind of impact that we're talking about. And I think, Dr. Robinson. And I think to add to that, James, also we have to be, what you said, we have to be major players in the decisions that are happening in those cities. If you take example where I am at West, in Winston-Salem, it's going through a kind of a rebirth or transformation in terms of now city of arts and innovation. But what I tell the leaders that be, 
you're not going to be a city of arts and innovation without Winston-Salem State University. We have to be central. We have to be a part of the. We have to be at the table making critical decisions about where the city goes. So I think when you talk about the evolution of these institutions, it means that we have to be major players in what happens in and around our communities, in and around our cities, because we have we make a tremendous difference in terms of economic mobility. That's where we, that's our sweet spot. <laughs> Students come to us uh, and, and they leave and they go out and they get jobs and they, they have a better life for themselves. We are proud that we are number one in the UNC system in the percentage of students who have a job six months after graduation. That's in the UNC system. That's a story that's not told. That's where we're making a difference. Thank you for telling that story, Dr. Akinleyi. I want to expand on the question of um, relevance just a bit. Um, for me today, yes, many of our institutions actually, when they were founded for a particular reason, to create access and opportunity for those who may not have had the opportunity to go elsewhere. We're talking about a different marketplace today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where our students now have options and different choices out there. We are also talking about marketplace now where the competition is severe, <coughs> where we are competing not only with ourselves, but we are competing with, you know, PWIs, private schools. And so it's important for us to not simply talk to ourselves, but to also talk to our alumni. Where is the question of resources for us? Yes, we educate low-income students. We do it very well. 70% of our students are pay recipients. 70% of our students work half-time or full-time. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are bright students, but we need to provide scholarship for them. Mm -hmm. If we don't, they will go elsewhere, especially the students who are really, really exceptional. So for us, we ought to be discussing where are we going to, what are we going to do to our alumni, to our supporters, how do we continue to make our institution relevant by providing the support that is necessary? That support is so, right. so very important. Right. And, right. and we definitely want to talk some more about support and so forth. I'd like to share, though, that, that Nelson's film, Tell Them We Are Rising, takes us to Howard University and to others that were incubators of Black activism and social justice, the thinking and actions of students at HBCUs in North Carolina, too, were the genesis of our country's greatest social change. And today's HBCU students remain committed to changing their communities for the better. There are generations, literally, of people that never would have had the opportunity for higher education at all had it not been for HBCUs. We're able to connect to our history, our ancestors, our past, our past struggles and learn from them, but not forget them. Martin Luther King actually spoke here in the chapel when nobody else in Greensboro will let him speak. Also, the Greensboro Four, a lot of people don't know that there was Bennett girls involved in that sitting. Being at an HBCU, you learn a fight that's not given everywhere. We are able to help at the local Boys and Girls Club around the corner and the other institutions that are in our area and come together on marches and um, voting rights and voting registration things. The responsibility of an African-American student is heavy. Fraternities and sororities were founded to mobilize and create a voice, a stronger voice and community for intercollegiate students. So the African-American students not only get a voice at an HBCU, but we get responsibilities. And we're given the opportunity to go back in our communities and give back. So now once we leave the college environment, we can take our new abilities to the world. So much social change has, has started at the, the HBCU level, and, and you certainly are familiar with that history at St. Augustine's College and also Shaw University, but, but people are, are somewhat familiar about SNCC, but I'd love for you to share a little bit about St. Augustine's College students in impacting uh, social change um, from your university. Well, uh, that has always been a fabric of St. Augustine's. Social justice and fighting for freedom and justice has been the foundation of St. Augustine's. I think uh, one of the more recent uh, has been when we look at the civil rights movement 
it was students from St. Augustine's and Shaw University working together. I think too often people try to paint us as arch rivals, mm -hmm. but in many cases, our students work very closely together. So it was students from St. Augustine's and Shaw University who met on Easter of 1960 under the leadership of Ella Baker and Dr. Martin Luther mm -hmm. King and formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating mm -hmm. Committee here in Raleigh. Uh, so there is that. But what I'm proud of, of our students is not only the history of yesterday, but the reality of today. today. So when I see <clears throat> my students, for example, walking to the polls on election day, I take great pride to walk with them because they understand that they have a place in American society to decide the future of this country and indeed the world. But then when I see students working with migrant farmers through our religious studies program, or when I see young men and women going out working with uh, mentoring young people, the millennials that we have under our umbrella now are ready for leadership. But I think it's incumbent upon us to give them a historical foundation where they understand the legacy that they have inherited. But then we have to give them the tools and affirm them. So when I see young students from St. Augustine's who go back to their respective communities and run for school board or run for city council, I celebrate them because as uh, Chancellor Anderson said, just being at the table of leadership where decisions are made is what we have to prepare our students for. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to have leadership development as a part of our curriculum so mm -hmm. that we are preparing them and giving them the tools to navigate this American system because they are the leaders of tomorrow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Dillard, you, you uh, I'm sure, are, are familiar with what Dr. Ward is saying. And when you think about where we are in our social political climate today and the work that the students at Shaw University want to do right now, what kind of work and activism are, are they engaged in? Deborah, I'm, I'm glad to share just recently there is a newfound interest in um, what we're calling civic engagement. And in October of, of 2017, Shaw University launched a series um, on civic engagement. And the inaugural lecture was given by um, Congressman David Price. And as a result of that lecture, um, that talked about the things that are going on in the on in the legislative environment right now. Many of those things are problematic for HBCUs. They're problematic for higher education, period. And as a result of becoming aware of those issues, the students at Shaw University are planning an HBCU advocacy day. And the whole idea is to gather support from HBCUs, not only in North Carolina, but around the country to join us on Capitol Hill on March the 20th to have their voices be heard around the issues that are especially troubling in the reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act, the Virginia Fox Bill. And we have got to have our young people learning to advocate for themselves, advocate for our institutions. And I am excited that Shaw University, once again, has a group of students who want to make a difference, not only for themselves, but for community at large. And we're excited about that. I think related to that is this Me Too movement. Uh, Bennett students have been involved in, in looking at that because they feel like, you know, we see Nita Hill as being the first Me Too. She was a black woman. And, and, and she sort of, it sort of went in the background. And so our students have been very concerned about the Me Too and how it has affected them. And so you'll see some activity taking place on our campus around that, even having Anita Hill come to campus to talk to us about it. That certainly helps the university. Dr. Akin Lee. It is also very important for us to build into our students, into our curriculum, the idea of service. <coughs> it's, it's bigger than you. It's the sacrifice that you make 
Uh, I believe we are the only institution in the system that uh, requires our students to complete 120 credit hours of service as part of the graduation requirement. What we're trying to do here is really to inculcate in, into our students that you live in this world and you have to be able to contribute into this world. They go out to build house for Habitat for Humanity, you know, showing people, you know, the pride of owning a home. You know, five o'clock in the morning, our students are out there helping to build a house for someone to have that opportunity. So I think it's important for us, the idea of service, uh, that you must do something that's bigger than yourself. You know, we have a program right now on our campus that's called Finish Line. Finish Line and Zone. These are students who, their last semester, they don't have $500. Now, you may think $500 is really a small amount. If they don't pay that, they drop out. They stop out. They may never come back. And so we've provided funds for them now to say, look, you are at the end zone. You are at the finish line. We're going to get you through that. But that's happening because of the support that we're getting from our alumni. Yeah, that real quickly. And in terms of alumni, we talk about these institutions. The survival of these institutions sometimes rests with alumni and their ability to support them at a very high level. I mean, it, I think all of us are would be surprised if I said that alumni giving to institutions at HBCU is around 5% of alumni. So we talk about sustaining these institutions. It means that we really have to start engaging our alumni in very significant ways. But it starts with a cultural shift. What we do at Western Salem State University in terms of that freshman, before they start their first year, we do something called Ramdition. It is really teaching them about the university experience or the WSSU experience. Part of that is service, and they have a community service project that they do the week before classes start. At the end of Ramdition, when they go through the archway, and we have our program. The last three years since I've been there, they've presented the university with a check before their first day of class. And so that begins to think about cultural change around philanthropy and giving back. Thank you for that. And right now, I'd like to go to um, Andrea Harris, who is in our audience, and you have been participating in a, a, an HBCU leadership roundtable to talk about some of the challenges around supporting HBCUs um, to help even more students and, and create an even greater impact. What are some of the, the greatest challenges? Well, naturally, I think we see today the greater challenge being that of the cost of higher education on one end and the state of uh, the financial state of the students. So that the cost has gone up. The public sector investment has not necessarily increased uh, proportionately to that cost. But when we look at the recession and the impact it's had, particularly on certain populations, we don't have those resources. So at the federal level, then what's happening when it comes to financial aid and support of financial, um, financially? And there's not been the investment. There's been a somewhat of a decrease, um, not the investment we need so students can be comfortable and not worry about uh, whether or not they'll be able to finish the semester or finish the year. And so we see some uptick in what we call, people are calling dropouts, we're calling them stopouts, because mm -hmm. the vast majority of students that are lost on these campuses don't come back, not because they don't want to finish their education, it's because they don't have the financial resources to return. So the challenge becomes at the federal level, how do we get the whole financial support system changed for students so that it becomes more reachable for them? And even when we talk about how many people have student loan debt and all of that, we still have to say to students that, you know, a bachelor's degree increases your lifetime earnings by at least one million dollars. I think that that, that mm -hmm. statistic kind of gets lost in the mm -hmm. argument around the strength of entrepreneurship. And in fact, I hear some millennials and, and even older to say, you know, considering how much it costs me to go to college and the fact that I can go ahead and either use my hands mm -hmm. and, and do some sort of vocational uh, occupation, own my own business. I don't need a, a degree to do those things. I don't need a degree to go out and start up. Um, my own software company or something like that. So, so how do you respond to that argument about the value of that college degree today in light of the cost? Well, I wanted to use a couple of examples here. 
if you look at those who are successful in the technology world, the Zuckerbergs and all of that, these are people who studied these ideas when they were in college, right in college. I think it's important for us at our HBCUs to begin to develop an ecosystem on our campus that encourages our students who have ideas and innovations. They're very, they're very good. How do you take it from inception to a startup? How do you get investors? How do you do that? On our campus in the, in the School of Business, we have the Venture Lab. Uh, we also have the Entrepreneurship Program. And these are things that we need to begin to do that when you graduate, you don't necessarily have to go work for someone. You can create jobs for others. And Deborah, we have to be careful to recognize that with robotics and technology, many of those jobs that use your hands, et cetera, will be done by machines. Similar to NCCU, uh, we have a wonderful partnership with the Carolina Small Business Development Fund to teach entrepreneurship and to see it in action. I'll just say real quickly, yes, we can also train our students to run robotics programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. So our students, we have a robotics program. Mm -hmm. Our students went out to California and competed against the top robotics programs in the country and won. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can. And that's a story that needs that's to a be story. Shared. But, mm -hmm. but, but the point I want to make about this conversation, especially Andrea's comments, et cetera, is HBCUs have to control their destiny more. Mm -hmm. I am surprised, and I even use the word shocked, at how few HBCUs are running capital campaigns now. So we're finishing ours, 25 million, which is really nothing as capital campaigns go, but 75% of that will be for scholarships. Okay, so when I talk to my, some of my fellow presidents and chancellors, not at this table, but other places, and I'll say, why aren't you doing a capital campaign? And they'll say, well, we're not ready. We're not ready to do it. You can do a $3 million campaign. It doesn't have to be 25 or 50. I, I, I just, it befuddles me how desperately they need dollars. They need revenue. They need scholarship money. They need to support their faculty research, young faculty research, and they won't even do a two or three million dollar campaign. I don't understand that. And to me, it's that the leadership has not come to grips with the fact that you have to control your own destiny. I can't rely on Virginia Fox and the federal government to do anything. Okay, I can't rely on the board of governors necessarily to look out for our interests. I want to make a comment about uh, loans and giving. Yeah. But I can't sit here as a bend of the loan yeah, and um, <laughs> not say that that lumps don't give because I yeah. do think of lumps give and. When you look at that chart of giving, then you know we have um, higher than a forty percent return of alums giving every year to our institution. Now, naturally, you put some women in the room, and we're gonna yeah. try to figure out <laughs> who's gonna do best. So it's not difficult for us to do that. Then we have to figure out from Jim Johnson to help us figure out how do we re make that successful. Well, thank thank you for <laughs> passing that question on that. to him, Dr. Johnson. Your expertise, yeah, please. <laughs> First and foremost, I think we have to recognize that our economy is in the midst of an unprecedented economic transformation. Uh, we have to prepare students for a new normal that I characterize as certain uncertainty. The only thing that we're going to face in the future is change, and it's going to occur at breakneck speed. So the question becomes, what do our kids need to have in their toolkits to be able to thrive and prosper in an economy and society where the new normal is certain uncertainty? They need entrepreneurial acumen, has already been played. Employers tell us they want workers who can groove on ambiguity because that's the nature of the landscape. And they want people who can peer through the fog of certain uncertainty, identify the opportunities to be taken advantage of and how to avoid the potential landmines in the marketplace so that they can continue to, to create shareholder value. You need um, impeccable soft skills, the ability to move from the streets to the suites without missing a beat. You need contextual intelligence to be able to read the tea leaves out there and anticipate unanticipated change and be positioned to, to take advantage of it. You need a lifelong learning mindset and the agility and flexibility to constantly reinvent yourself. When we began to rebrand re ourselves as creating and producing students who have that in their toolkits, I don't know that it's as important what you major in as it is to walk away to say, I have these, these who's I am built to land and built to compete, thrive, and prosper in a new normal of certain uncertainty. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I'd like for you to hand your mic okay. to your right. Uh, as a proud alumnus of, of Shaw University, um, I, I will say for the Divine Nine, we have a representative on the HBCU 
um, roundtable. Um, but I, I think for many of us, it's a matter of pulling together those resources that we have as a divine nine and utilizing them for student success. Many of us, we, we have these great scholarship funds that we build. Um, and that's in our, whether it's your local chapter, your state or your international. Um, I, I think we need to look at some form of reallocating those funds, maybe more towards those HBCUs. Um, and we do give scholarships, uh, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, all of us, uh, part of the Divine Nine, do give scholarships. But I think we focus a lot more on the scholarship part when they need to direct help to those institutions. Mm -hmm. And there's the networking aspect. We're going to talk a little bit more about networking and, and, and the important and critical value of establishing those networks for your students so that they can have those opportunities once they graduate. But first, I'd like to share another story because many students who are attending HBCUs are challenged uh, in their lifestyles beyond their economic status. And the transformative impact of these institutions is a story untold. So we're going to tell a story. Let's take a look. When you recognize that 71% of our students are first generation college students in 2018, that is unbelievable. But we're taking those students who are first generation and we are moving them into places that they would never have dreamed of. We get, get students who come to us with dreams and hopes and we help them find their way, their path, if you will, to accomplishing that. You can go anywhere from Elizabeth City State University. We build them and we ensure that they are prepared for the future. And we don't know what the future is, but what we can do is to ensure that their soft skills are in a, enhanced. We are, in a sense, building a holistic student for the future that hopefully we have done what we need to do. Livingstone College will transform you because it will teach you to push further than yourself, to not be your own limit, your own obstacle, as being not only successful academically, but spiritually, mentally, and financially in the global society. They come here with one mindset, but when they come out, they're more mature. They know what's going on in the world, how the market works, what is uh, what is the emerging trends in the industry. So they are more globally aware compared to what they were when they came to the program. We want them to go out to be leaders in the world. And we want them to use whatever skills that they learn here to make the world a better place. They are becoming change agents because they are not only going back out with the academic skills, they're going out with the social skills and with the civic skills that allow them to be very uh, vibrant and, and vigorous uh, citizens of, their, of wherever they land. We have a comment uh, from our audience, and I'd like for you to just briefly tell us your name and, and what's your question or your comment. Okay, my name is Pam Oxendine. I am uh, a product of HBCU. Uh, I have five children. And uh, I have three of them that went to HBCUs. But I noticed a difference in the private and the public ones. But the biggest thing I wanted to make, uh, to put out to the panel here is, is there a difference with the funding when the private HBCU or a public one? Can anybody answer that? Thank you very much for that question. The difference between public and private is is very significant where those where those dollars come from. Um, I and what I'd like for what I'd like to do is to, is direct that question to you, Dr. Anderson. In addition to this question um, about accreditation. Well, first of all, private HBCUs tend to be much more tuition driven than the publics. And you know, here in the UNC system, we have five HBCUs that are publicly funded, but our funding has declined from about sixty five percent of our budget down to what, 30, 35% now, okay? So now we're, in a way, that forces your hand. You must get out there now and find more resources yourself and develop the experience to do that, uh, to be successful. Um, 
I served on SACS, which is the Southern Association of Colleges and Universities. And it's the SACS COC. And it is the, <laughs> and it is, wait till I come to Winston-Salem. <laughs> and it is, and it is the CO, it is, yeah, you threw me off, man. You know, it is the accrediting body for, you know, all the institutions from like Maine to Texas, pretty much. So when you look at that swath of HBCUs in Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina alone, SACS is responsible for all of those. SACS's purpose is to really identify accountability at institutions. And all of us, all CEOs, all leaders of HBCUs should welcome accountability. Well, why do so many HBCUs have problems? And I visit them. I lead site teams down, especially when they're on probation, et cetera. Uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to institutional leadership, especially from the board and the president's office. In SACS, we have core values and standards. One of the standards might have to do with governance. Who makes decisions at your institution? How are they made? Well, the board of trustees is not supposed to run your institution, but I go to HBCUs where the board of trustees is running the institution and the president and everybody else are just figureheads, okay? Well, you're gonna get in trouble if you do that. We're gonna come down and drop the ax on you if you do that, because that is not one of the core values and standards associated. Do students learn? At the end of the day, our primary responsibility is teaching and learning at all of our institutions. Most institutions, not just HBCUs, have a hard time demonstrating that students actually learn. We talk a good game, but you have to be evidence-based. One of the things I like about Dr. Johnson's data when he presents it on the changing demographics in the country is it's data-driven, it's evidence-based. The HBCUs that have trouble when they have accreditation visits, they often they always fall into two categories, fiscal problems, they're not managing their money well, they don't have business models, and institutional effectiveness. They don't have the processes in place to make sure, for example, students learn. Thank you so much for that, that explanation. We're gonna finish talking. Um, yes, Dr. Robinson. I wanted to follow up with, with um, Dr. Anderson's comments about accreditation and strong institutions. I really believe that uh, great institutions are great because of leadership. And I think there are some critical uh, positions that you ought to have at a strong institution. You ought to have a very strong provost because of academic issues. You ought to have a dynamic CFO because of the financial and fiscal management of the system. You ought to have a very strong um, a marketing and, uh, and communications person because you have to tell the story. No one is going to tell the story but you, and you have to be aggressive about telling that story. And don't these institute don't these institutions know that? But I do think I do think well, Chancellor uh, Robinson made a point earlier that is critical for all of us to embrace. Our institutions will survive, particularly private institutions, when our alumni make the first commitment to financially support our institutions. But it's one thing to come to homecoming. Mm -hmm and to wear the paraphernalia of your institution. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't made a donation mm -hmm. at any level, $25 to you take the highest number, that helps the institutions, particularly private institutions. Mm -hmm. Because for many of us who've had financial challenges, trying to change the culture to say to alum, you know, we know that you had an issue with the registrar 30 years ago. <laughs> Guess what? Get over that. <laughs> but, but we need, well, but we, but like we, to, but I, we I would need like to jump else. in for a second. I would like to jump in because uh, we can certainly go down that road. However, what we're talking about is the fact that these institutions continue to make a tremendous difference in the lives of, of many students and impact the, the larger community in very positive ways. Without these institutions, and I'm not just talking about 50 years ago or at the time of their establishing, continuing to make that impact in surrounding communities. Yeah, Dr. absolutely. Robinson. For example, when I when I got to Winston-Salem State and we looked at what was happening um, in Forsyth County, and it was at the time, if you were born in Forsyth County, it was the second most difficult county to escape poverty in the country. The only other county is somewhere in South Dakota. And so when you talk about what the, what the problem and what the issues are, the issues around education, and, and issues around for the fact that African-Americans in that county read at a third grade reading level about 33 percent. And so how are you going to escape poverty if you don't have education? But we talk about Winston-Salem and Winston-Salem Teachers College. Teachers 
So you go around and many of our institutions were involved in teaching. And that's how you change the dynamic and the structure of our communities. I'd like to bring in an, an alum from Johnson C. Smith University who is in our audience today. And he's looking around, but I'm looking right at him, uh, <laughs> Secretary Larry Hall. What can you share about uh, what's happening on the, on the policy-wide uh, landscape to help support or that might, might be working against HBCUs right now? Well, we know that the state has, and it's already been cited, reduced support for HBCUs as well as reduced support for our universities uh, across the board. The idea that Dr. Ward brought up about supporting your university if you're an alum or if you're a member of the community that benefits because of the university. You can support them individually by the organizations you're in, by where you worked and getting involved in challenge campaigns and other things to ensure that your corporations and where you work support your university. After all, you're the human capital that they got from that university. So we have to be as HBCU graduates advocating at every level, not just the personal level. When it comes to making policy though, many people would be surprised that one of the top uh, schools producing legislators, and, and I say producing, that legislators have attended is North Carolina Central University. One of the top schools producing judges, North Carolina Central University's law school in the state of North Carolina. But what does that say? What that says is folks need to get with their representatives and make support of their universities and their communities. I call them communiversities mm -hmm. because the communities that are built up around them, they have to get with those legislators and policymakers and put that foot in behind them and make them deliver. And I say make them because they can do things that you can't do. Um, Alma Adams, Bennett Bell, Bell two-time <laughs> Aggie, and Gladys Robinson. And, and Gladys Robinson. But one of her famous sayings is, most of the time someone's going to make a decision about you without, without you. you. Meaning when your legislators and policymakers go behind the door, you don't know what really happened there. You're going to get some opinions or somebody's version of what happened. It's usually going to make them look good. I fought hard, but I couldn't overcome it. And they're not going to deliver. And so we have to be the guardians of that future. We got to teach them what sacrifices were made so these universities exist, but we've got to go forward and give them that courage and continue to push to make sure the funding is there, the resources are there. It's a great investment, and uh, I encourage everybody to give in every single way you can. Be creative. Um, and I'm also the chairman of the Legislative Black Caucus Foundation, <laughs> and we give scholarships to all of these HBCUs, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure it, it's understood mm -hmm that we don't do enough. There's so much more that we can talk about. What I'd like to do is, because we have uh, run out of time for this discussion, and it has been an outstanding conversation. Uh, what I would like to do, um, it, it is, and I, I, I want to hear more. Now, now who's running the show? You know, <laughs> oh, is that what you do? Well, you know, I, what I'm going to do is, is is table the conversation for just a few moments so we can close. But I'm going to keep the conversation going and invite our viewers to join us online for this conversation because it's not going to go to waste. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today for this program. To all of our, our presidents and chancellors, thank you so much for your time. And for more information about today's program, please visit us online at video.unctv.org slash BIF. You can also follow us on Twitter using the hashtag NC Black Issues. Thanks to all of our audience members also for taking the time to come out. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Good night, everyone. I am led to wonder how are we helping students to manage those loans? And right now, I see an African American community health is so is our number one detriment. It's not anything else killing us. This is not just about education. This is about survival. I don't want to say we're in jeopardy, but people are questioning our our viability, and I think we are very viable. When you're able to take 
uh, someone whose whose path was was headed a different direction and actually turned that around. That's transformative. That's creative, and that's extremely powerful. Uh, we have to prepare students for a new normal that I characterize as certain uncertain. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC TV. Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. If we're going to prepare students to really have that impact we're talking about, then we have to prepare entrepreneurs. We, we can let students major in finance or we can make them top-notch financial managers. Okay, So we have to think of the ways that we expand what have been our historical majors and disciplines to those that really make this kind of impact that we're talking about. When it was originally founded, it was to uh, allow people who were not going to have, have the opportunity otherwise to participate in what was going to be a growing economy. We still do what other institutions are either unwilling or unable to do for a population of our citizens who desperately need it, and that is provide educational opportunity. We started out as a, a part of the economic engine of Northeast and North Carolina. They knew that there were going to be people that were not going to be able to participate in the economy if they didn't have education. And one of the best ways to do that was to teach teachers who could spread out across Northeast and North Carolina and do the job necessary of raising the level of education for all of the people in the area. I think it's important for people to realize that we're not strictly only for African Americans. That any race, religion, creed can come to ECSU and be comfortable. North Carolina is one of the more progressive southern states in the nation. And that didn't just happen. It happened because our institutions are major contributors to educated citizens. That's why it's so important. If they did not exist, North Carolina would not be positioned where it is as an economic and social advanced state. Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. It's the idea that our students at HBCUs have been at the forefront of fighting for equal education, the opportunity for access in all of our HBCUs, and we're still doing that today.
Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. So for me, you know, I'm incredulous that there's a question of the value of an HBCU. Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. So I think we're making um, a tremendous economic impact in terms of just our students being out there and giving back to the community. And historically, black colleges have that legacy. I mean, we have always been involved in the community. I mean, I think other groups are trying to pick up on that. And so I, I, I think we continue to make that um, contribution. Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. Education provides our young people the opportunity to be able to become fairly represented in our communities. And so that's what this is all about. Education is our civil rights struggle of today. And we need to make sure that as we educate more of our people, they can move into those tables and places around the city and otherwise and represent us where decisions are being made. Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. And I think it's very important for us to understand the relevancy of historical black colleges continues, but we also need to remove the myth that historically black colleges are less prepared academically than any other institutions. Black Issues Forum takes a look at how HBCUs have shaped the economic and social landscape of our state. When you talk about the evolution of these institutions, it means that we have to be major players in what happens in and around our communities, in and around our cities, because we have, we make a tremendous difference in terms of economic mobility. That's where we, that's our sweet spot. An unruly white mob destroyed part of this city, which was the black community. Tulsa and the state of Oklahoma have never made amends for that. If we can give them some better idea of what happened and where the remains of their family members are, that's the goal. Until they obtain justice for the descendants, there can't be healing. Stanley Nelson, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us here with Black Issues Forum. And why did you want to bring this documentary to, to so many different audiences through PBS? Well, there's so many different reasons. Uh, you know, one is that, you know, HBCUs have meant so much to African Americans and meant so much to this country as a whole. The other is my personal history with HBCUs. The other is that there's great uh, footage and great pictures at HBCUs and great stories at HBCUs. And, you know, one of the things that PBS does is it reaches you know over 98 percent of households in the u.s so this film is available to everybody and another thing pbs does is is uh you know what we call now impact or audience engagement it reaches out to audiences and tries to bring audiences in and, and we really felt that that was something we wanted to do with this film 
So you had an opportunity, I would imagine, to screen this film with different kinds of audiences. What kinds of, what have been the like different responses you've got? You know, the responses to the film have just been incredible. We premiered the film at Sundance Film Festival, and uh, you know, which was a largely you know white audience, and and you know, we got a standing ovation. I mean, it was crazy because we had, we had actually finished the film on a Thursday night, and we screened the film the next Monday morning. So we had never even seen the film. You know, we were just pressing to try to get it done for for Sundance, and and then to get a standing ovation, you know, in Utah in the middle of a su- snowstorm was just incredible. Um, and people were actually crying and saying, you know, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't even know HBCU existed. I, I never knew this story. Um, and so that was great and it was wonderful. But then when we screened the film for the first time with a largely black audience and people started showing up in their school colors and their fraternity and sorority colors and hats and t-shirts and sweatshirts, it was a whole different thing. I mean, people were applauding during the film, you know, when they would see a shot of their school, uh, that was a whole other, a whole other level. It just kind of raised the bar a little bit. Because you didn't go exclusively to HBCUs, you can kind of make that comparison. And so since you've had an opportunity to to navigate both waters, how would you describe the difference? I mean, I I think at the core, look, there's so many differences, but I think at the core, the HBCU experience is a nurturing experience. And that's what it's been from the beginning. And that's what it still is today. And that's a little bit different from most majority white institutions. HBCU is, is an experience that says,